Tonight's session is an introductory review to alcohol reactions because this is a topic that will come up over and over in advanced synthesis. And it's the kind of topic that you want to make sure just because it's not difficult doesn't mean you can skip past it, doesn't mean you can just memorize. I want you to understand. I want it to be intuitive. I want you to be able to quickly refer back to pull an alcohol reactions out of your um, arsenal or whatever you want to call it when you're working on more advanced synthesis. And so what we'll do today is we'll start with a quick review of alcohol concepts to make sure you know how to apply it. Then we'll jump right into reactions because this is what you're here for and I want to make sure we cover as many reactions as we can without obviously making it too overwhelming. For even more practice after this session, if you want to test yourself on anything we discussed today, make sure you sign up for the worksheet. The link is layerforsci.com slash live. You'll also see it in the pinned comment. And once I'm done, I'll send you the notes from today. I'll send you information on how to access the recording and of course the worksheet so that you can do additional practice on everything that we covered today. So with that, let's jump into a quick overview. If we're talking about alcohols, well, we should quickly review what is an alcohol. And yes, I know alcohol is a thing that you drink when you're having a party or whatever. That is one alcohol. But in general, alcohol is when you have the functional group OH on a molecule. If you're thinking of drinking alcohol, you're thinking of ethanol specifically. That's a two carbon chain with an OH. But there are so many more. You can have linear alcohols. You can have branched alcohols. And I'm drawing molecules you should recognize. You can also have molecules that have a lot more going on. For example, one that you'll see a lot is phenol, especially when you're reviewing resonance. This is the common go-to example. What all of these have in common is that you have an OH group as the highest priority functional group on your molecule. Now, do not mix this up with a molecule that is pretending to be an alcohol. For example, this one right here, even though it has an OH, it also has the carbonyl. So this is not an alcohol. This is a carboxylic acid. And a lot of students do confuse this. So hopefully by this point, you're confident enough with it. Now, I actually got ahead of myself. I meant to tell you who this workshop is for. So if you're here tonight because you're studying organic chemistry at the undergraduate level or you're preparing for an exam like the MCAT, the PCAT, the DAT, and you have undergraduate level organic chemistry, then this is the level that we're going to be covering. Typically, this is seen in the beginning of Orgo 2. So what I just covered now and a couple more topics that I'm going to review is what you should have seen in beginning organic chemistry, organic chemistry one, but then the reactions, that's where it gets a little bit more advanced. In looking at alcohols, your professors are not going to draw a molecule and tell you to do a reaction. They're going to give you the name of a molecule and expect that you know what it is so that you can do a reaction. When you're naming an alcohol, it's very simple. The suffix, the ending, is going to be OL. So if we look at drinking alcohol, let's apply the naming tips that I teach in my nomenclature series. First thing we want to do is identify the parent chain. I have a total of two carbons. That gives first name of F. I only have single bonds in the molecule. That gives me a last name of Ain. And my functional group is an alcohol, which gives me the suffix of OL. Now, because I have a vowel followed by a functional group that has a vowel to start the suffix, we drop that E and put the whole thing together. This gives me a name of ethanol. 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 This one didn't require any numbers because there's only one place you can put alcohol, and that's on carbon number one. But if I give you something a little bit more complex, you have to be more specific. So let's say I give you a molecule that looks like this. We identify the parent chain, one, two, three, four. Four carbons gives me a first name of bute. Only single bonds gives me a last name of ain. 
I have a substituent of carbon three, that's a methyl. And now because the alcohol is not implied to be on carbon one, it could be on any carbon, I do have to specify that it's one whole. To put this together, we first start with the functional group. That would be three methyl. I'm sorry, not the functional group, the substituent. Then there's two ways you can name this. You can drag the one out before the start of the parent name, and that would give me one butane, but because the ol is with an O, we drop the E, one butanol, or perfectly acceptable other option is three methyl butane for the first and last name, dash one dash all to show that it shows up, the alcohol shows up on carbon number one. When you're looking at alcohols, it can appear on different degree of substituted carbon. And so it's important to know how to identify, how to recognize those. Let me show you a few examples. If I have a molecule that looks like this, notice the position of the alcohol is different than this one, which is different than this one. And the easiest way I find to know what the substitution is, we look at the carbon holding the oxygen and we do the pencil trick, which I have linked in the description. The pencil trick says that, and this is a trick that I made up. So technically I say that to do the pencil trick, you simply draw an arrow from your carbon holding the oxygen to any carbon atoms directly attached to it. Because this one only has one arrow, one bond to another carbon, this is considered a primary alcohol. If I do the same thing over here, I have my carbon, I put my pencil down, or in this case, my stylus. I have two bonds coming to carbon. That means this is a secondary alcohol because the alcohol sits on a secondary carbon. Brittany, I am also so glad that you caught this. So hopefully this comes at a good time for you. I want to see your questions and comments, participation. This is from everyone. And lastly, for the third one, if I highlight my carbon holding the alcohol, I have one, two, and three. Three bonds to carbon. That means it's a tertiary carbon, making this a tertiary alcohol. So these are the three types of, of uh, degrees of substitution that we can see on an alcohol. You can see a quaternary alcohol because that would give carbon four bonds to carbon plus one to alcohol, making it five bonds to carbon, which obviously is not allowed. If you have any questions on what I covered so far, go ahead and type it in. The next thing that I wanna talk about, I'm not gonna go into all the physical properties, because there's a lot that you should have covered in your lecture. I'm gonna talk about specifically what we need to know to understand reactions, because that is what we're trying to focus on today. And specifically, I wanna look at the polarity of an OH. So if I have an alcohol, it doesn't matter which one it is, I'm only interested right now in the oxygen and the hydrogen. Oxygen, you should recognize, is a small, highly electronegative atom. Hydrogen is just an itty bitty atom, or as my toddler says, EBBB, and it has its one electron. Because oxygen is electronegative, it's a greedy atom. And what it does is it pulls the electronegativity from itself, from, I'm sorry, from the hydrogen onto itself. So even though the bond is technically covalent, they should be perfectly sharing, oxygen is hogging those electrons, making it an unequal, unfair bond, so that if you look at oxygen, it's very, very partially negative. That makes hydrogen with the exposed nucleus very partially positive. This comes into play for so many things like solubility and boiling point. Alcohols have a higher boiling point than other molecules of the same length because of this intense interaction. And in fact, I'll show you what happens if I bring another alcohol nearby and I have the hydrogen and oxygen lined up like this. The partially negative oxygen, whoops, 
That's supposed to be this. Partially negative oxygen, partially positive hydrogen will attract the opposites. Negative and positive interact with each other. Negative and positive interact with each other. Given that the hydrogen is so partially positive, this also comes into place into play if we're looking at acid-base reactions. And alcohol is very, very mildly acidic. The only alcohol that is more acidic than water is methanol. And so if you think back to a basic, no pun intended, acid-base reaction, if I bring a molecule of water, it will use the lone electron pairs on oxygen to grab that partially positive hydrogen, give the oxygen back its electrons, and that will give me a reaction that favors the right, because this is the only alcohol more, the only simple alcohol, I should clarify, more acidic than water. For a product that looks like this, with now three lone pairs of electrons, this bond right here is now sitting as that third lone pair with a negative charge. And then water is sitting as hydronium in solution with the two hydrogens that it had to begin with. And then a new bond, which I'll show as the purple electrons, binding it to the hydrogen that it stole from the oxygen. Now, this is not an ideal reaction, but if you're trying to make an RO minus, as we'll see in, say, SN2 reactions or E2 reactions, you need an RO minus. One way to do it is use a stronger base than water that will guarantee the reaction going to the right. So that is the basics of what I want to cover in terms of foundation leading up to the concepts of reactions. If you have any questions on this, go ahead and type it in. Otherwise, I'm going to jump into reactions, starting with a review of alcohol-related reactions you covered in Organic Chemistry 1, and then we'll go into the more advanced reactions for Organic Chemistry 2. Richard has an exam on Thursday, including alcohols. Yeah, so the alcohol portion I'll cover tonight. And at the end of the workshop, I'll tell you how you can get access to the other sessions that I've done on all those topics. So let's do a review of beginner reactions. And the first I want to look at is how to form an alcohol. So alcohol formation. Because you're in the alcohol chapter, you're going to have synthesis questions that ask you to either make or use an alcohol. And your professor will expect that you remember the reactions from Orga 1. You can't just have the alcohol. It's going to start with another molecule. Which molecules do you remember that can be reacted to give you an alcohol? Stella, absolutely. Alkene addition reactions, yes. An alkene is one molecule that we can start with. So I'm going to show you an alkene that looks like this. And the reason I'm choosing this one, I have one alkene and using three different reagents, I can get three different alcohols. So based on the type of alcohol I want to form, I will be very specific, very intentional with the reagents that I use. So what are the three reactions? Let me know in the comments if you remember that can give me an alcohol. And I'll give you a hint. What's different between the three that I'm looking for is where that alcohol is going to wind up. If you're not comfortable with alkene reactions and you want to dig in deeper, I have my alkene series linked in the description. That way you can watch the step-by-step -step mechanisms because today we're just doing an overview. Use this overview as a refresher and whatever you don't know, go back to the videos and watch in detail to make sure that you are crystal clear. In the comments, I see hydroboration, H2SO4, which is acid catalyzed hydration, and oxymercuration. Richard, you are absolutely correct. Those are the three reactions that we are going to look at. Hold on. I have... There we go. Excellent. So these are the three reactions we're going to look at. Let's start with acid catalyzed hydration. So I'll just put a note here. Acid cat hydration. That way when you're reviewing the notes, you'll know what we're looking at. For this reaction, we want to use a strong acid like H2SO4 and dissolve it in water. 
Sometimes your professor will just put H2SO4 where the water is implied. That's aqueous sulfuric acid. And if I number my starting molecule as follows, one, two, three, four, where is the alcohol going to wind up for my first reaction, for the acid catalyzed hydration? While you're thinking about that, the second one we want to look at is, um, I'm going to go in a different order, oxymercuration. And this one is when we use HgOAC2, H2O, that's step one, step two, and ABH4. Okay. And again, same question. Where does the alcohol wind up? One, two, three, or four. And lastly, hydroboration. Oh, why am I writing the name here? I'll put it right here. Hydroboration. The B in boration should be your clue. Oxymercuration, the merc in mercuration should be your clue for that one. And hydroboration will be most commonly for this one, BH3, THF, step one. Step two, NaOH, H2O2, and some will also show H2O, but mostly it's shown like this. Okay, so where do the alcohols wind up? For acid catalyzed hydration, if the pi bond is on carbons one and two, somehow, some way, the alcohol winds up here on carbon three. This is the tricky one, and that's why I put it first. This is tricky, and the reason that happens is because we have a carbocation intermediate, we get a hydride shift. Think through the mechanism. We're not going to draw it out. But if I break the pi bond, the carbocation will go on the most substituted carbon, which in this case is a secondary carbon. But if you caught my hydride shift video, which I think I also have linked below in the alkene series, you should recognize the trick. And I'll put it here as a note. Anytime you have a secondary carbocation near a tertiary carbon, you are going to get a hydride shift. And that is why the carbocation winds up on this position and the alcohol ultimately winds up on that same position. For oxymercuration, even though we have partial positive on the intermediate, I think of mercury as a carbocation babysitter. It allows the carbocation to think about forming, but it doesn't let go. It's like my kid in the parking lot. Anytime we're in a parking lot, he just wants to run everywhere. The cars can't see him. He's tiny, so he has a role. You have to hold mommy's hand in a parking lot. And of course, he tries to run away. But like mercury, don't let him go. No rearrangement, no shifts. That puts the alcohol on the secondary position because this is a Markovnikov addition, follows Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov, I think I said it right. And last but not least, hydroboration. This is an anti-Markovnikov because it has nothing to do with the carbocation. It has a concerted mechanism for the first part of the mechanism. And that gives me a primary alcohol, an anti-Markovnikov less substituted. So notice how we had one alkene, three different reagents, and three different alcohol products. Now, if the starting molecule is different, we may not always get three products. But in this case, I specifically chose, chose this molecule so we can differentiate between how they react so that you can see. If I have to do synthesis and I need the alcohol and the primary carbon, I want to use hydroboration. If I can't afford a carbocation rearrangement, I need to use oxymercuration. And if I need a substituted alcohol, but rearrangement is not an issue, then I use acid catalyzed hydration. Um, okay, I just realized the comments are blocking. So now you should be able to see the bottom as well. Matthew, I'm not sure what you mean by no, <laughs> so let me know what that's in reference to. 
So this is one reaction that you need to remember or one set of reactions that you need to remember. And this is your alkenes. So again, the alkene chapter, I have a link in the description for all my videos on it. The next reaction that is going to help us get an alcohol, also a review from Organic Chemistry 1, is substitution. How many substitution reactions do you know that can give you an alcohol? Well, two, right? You have the SN1 and the SN2. With an SN1 reaction, as a reminder, the key difference between SN1 and SN2, SN1 is substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. This is a multi-step reaction because it's one at a time. This is slow. And the key factor to recognize with an SN1 reaction is that you have a carbocation intermediate. So make sure you can afford one. And that is differentiated from SN2, which is fast and absolutely no carbocation intermediate. Key, key difference. When doing synthesis, I prefer to keep everything controlled because I wouldn't want to lose points for potential side products. And so I typically go with SN2, but I want to show you both reactions. Let's start with SN1. We're not going to go through the entire mechanism. I have that one linked in the description as well. For the SN1 reaction, we're looking at a molecule that has a leaving group, for example, a bromine. We're reacting it with a mild H2SO4 in water. What will happen is the bromine will leave, we get a carbocation intermediate, water comes in to attack, and then we deprotonate. So our product is just an alcohol where the leaving group was, assuming we don't have any carbocation rearrangements. This is the SN1 reaction. For SN2, the reaction for this starting molecule would actually be pretty much the same, except I have to use a different set of reagents. To get that alcohol, I'll use something like NaOH because I specifically want the OH minus. But to make sure I don't turn this into an elimination reaction, to make sure that it's substitution only, what is the key differentiator between substitution and elimination in terms of controlling the reaction when I have the same attacker and the same starting molecule? The solvent. The solvent is key. I want to use a polar aprotic solvent, for example, DMSO. And this time, instead of a carbocation intermediate, I'll just put carbocation like this. Instead of a carbocation intermediate, this is a one-step attack. It's a concerted mechanism. Sorry, not concerted. It's the OH attacks and kicks out the bromine. That will immediately give me my product as an alcohol. The difference, though, is let's say this started as a chiral molecule. What will be the difference in chirality between SN1 and SN2? This is critical if your professor gets nitty gritty enough to ask for stereochemistry. The difference is very simple. Because I have a carbocation intermediate, the intermediate is, the intermediate is sp2 hybridized. It's flat. It can get attacked from the top or the bottom, giving me a racemic product, meaning I'll get half R, half S. But for this one, I'm going to get an inversion of configuration. I get the opposite chirality. Uh, Richard, no, we're not going to have time. But I'll talk about it at the end very quickly. All right. If you are watching this for the first time, if you're watching one of my live streams for the first time, or for whatever reason you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and click that subscribe button really quick. And we will move on to, well, let's go and reverse some of these reactions because your professor is expecting more than just the formation. Your professor also wants to see you do the opposite. So let's say I have a molecule that has an alcohol. Uh, actually, before I continue, so these are reactions that you should have learned in Orga 1. 
alkene reactions and substitution. Some students will also have learned reduction of a carbonyl. Let me know in the comments if you have covered that. I'm not going to look at it today because I know a lot of you haven't seen it yet, but I'm curious in the comments, have you done reduction reactions in organic chemistry one? All right, so let's take a look at reversing. So these are reactions of alcohols. And even though this is technically a new reaction, you should recognize many of the steps from what you've already seen in organic chemistry one. So let's take a look at, say, a tertiary halogen. I'm sorry, a tertiary alcohol. But I want to get rid of the alcohol. For whatever reason, whatever I'm trying to create, I want a halogen on here. Because it's tertiary, I will get away with a very simple reaction. You tell me if you recognize what kind of reaction this is. Say I react it with HCl and I put it into ether. Ether, you'll recognize, is a polar aprotic solvent. And halogens, the Cl minus, even though it's a very poor base, it does make a good nucleophile. So what will happen here is the alcohol, being electronegative and greedy, attacks the hydrogen, breaks off the chlorine. This gives me an intermediate with an oxonium. I have the OH with another H, lone pair negative charge. That makes a good leaving group. And it leaves. I know this is a little bit confusing because ether typically gives us SN2, but we cannot do an SN2 with a tertiary leaving group. So we have to wait for it to leave. I want to say there's also some water here. I think the solvent might be mixed, but you don't want too much water. Otherwise, it'll add back in. So that's where this reaction is a little confusing. If we have a carbocation, then chlorine, a good halide, will take advantage of this situation, attack. And that is one way to turn an alcohol into an alkyl halide. You absolutely want to know quite a few reactions for turning alcohols into alkyl halides because these are your precursor to so many different things like a Grignard or something else that you're going to use in your bigger, more advanced, more crazy multi-step synthesis. I see a comment that the stream is delayed. So let me know as soon as you see me scribbling. I want to know how long it takes for you to be able to see that. What I showed you here, this is an SN1 reaction. And I specifically used a tertiary alcohol. But what if I'm trying to get rid of a secondary alcohol or a primary alcohol? These are not going to react as well, especially if I try to do something similar because the carbocation may not form, the halogen may not attack. It just, it gets a lot more complicated. And so in this case, what is going to happen is we have to do something else. Let's use a simple example. Say I have CH3OH, I have methanol. And I want to turn this into CH3Cl. There is no way this is turning into a carbocation. It's a methyl. It's very unstable. Alcohol in itself is a very bad leaving group. And if you remember in my substitution elimination videos, I teach a four-part checklist where the last step is leaving group. Will it leave or not? And typically in that workshop, I only looked at things that would leave. Here alcohol is not going to leave. And so what we have to do, if we have a bad leaving group, we have to bribe it. Bribe the leaving group, turn it into something that would be happy leaving. And when we turn it into something that would be happy leaving, well, it's going to leave. And <laughs> that will allow us to do the reaction. The two common bribes, well, actually the first bribe is the one we already did here, protonate it. It won't always work. It gives us rearrangement. It gives us messy products. But the two bribes that you're going to learn, the two common bribes, are if we want a chlorine or a bromine. So let's start with bromine. If I, I did a chlorine there, so I'm just going to 
do another reaction here. Say I want to turn ethanol into an ethyl bromide, a bromine on carbon number one. I'm going to react it with something like this, PBr3. I'm not going to do the mechanism here. Most of your professors will not require it. If your professor does require it, make sure you A, find out, and B, take the time to learn it. So we'll have PBr3. This will wind up attaching here, becoming something big that is a good leaving group, and then another bromine will come in and attack. This is going to give me a bromine. And then a side product, what we're also going to get is H3PO3. So this is just a simple overview of the reaction where the key is to recognize PBr3 is the way to get rid of an alcohol to put a bromine on there. The more common one, the one that you probably do need the mechanism for, again, a small percentage of students will need the mechanism, but for the, this one, more students are going to need it. If I react the alcohol with SOCl2, actually, this is not the one. It's the next one. I forgot about it, so I'll show that to you in a moment. One option here is SOCl2 in pyridine. Again, what will happen is this entire thing will attach to the oxygen, turn it into a bigger, better leaving group, and as a result, I will have chlorine, and then a side product will be SO2 plus HCl. The one that you probably do have to know, and I'll, you know what, let me show you the mechanism for the next one. The next one is also to get a chlorine on there, but this one is going to use a tosyl chloride in pyridine. So let's talk, take a moment to talk about this tosyl chloride, and I'll show it over here. Para toluene sulfonyl chloride. That's what the molecule is. So toluene, like that. Para toluene sulfonyl chloride. Um, why am I drawing a blank? Hang on, it's like this. Okay, I was trying to think where the chlorine goes on here, but there's no chlorine on there. The chlorine is here. I was having a brain fart. Okay, this right here, this monstrosity, is what makes the alcohol such a good leaving group. So let me show you, and then the other ones work very similarly, but they're not as big and they're not as bulky. So what happens is if I have an alcohol, the alcohol has reactive electrons, that are greedy. They're electronegative. They want to attack. And the electrons will attack the sulfur. Now, sulfur can absorb the attack because resonance will kick off one of the oxygen's pi bonds. But then when the pi bond comes back to reform, or when the electrons come back to reform the pi bond, chlorine gets kicked out. This is the key to starting the mechanism because, and this is what I want to show you, what makes this so good Oh, this is going to be a pain to draw. I'm just going to draw the circle for simplicity. What makes this such a good leaving group? Now, there's going to be, we're using pyridine. I'll just put minus H plus because that one also gets pulled off. The reason this is such a good leaving group is because now, if I bring in the chlorine that got kicked out, that chlorine will attack as an SN2 reaction and kick this out. Now, this is what I want to focus on. Look at the group that just got kicked out. I have an oxygen bound to a sulfur, double bound oxygen, double bound oxygen, and then this big messy thing attached to it. Now, you may also have heard of, this is a tosylate, but a mesylate would have been just a methyl group here. Same idea. Somebody asked me in an email before tonight to cover the mesylate, so same idea. Now, look at this. I have the extra lone pair of electrons sitting right here with a negative charge. If I were to kick out just the OH, and I show minus OH, then what I have left in solution is an OH minus. It's strong. It's an attacker. It's unhappy. It's going to attack right back. But this oxygen is not just left hanging out with a hydrogen. This oxygen can resonate this way. 
this oxygen can resonate this way. It's fully stabilized. That's the idea behind all three of these reactions. We're turning the alcohol into a good leaving group that we can then very easily kick out using bromine, chlorine, and in the one that I just showed you, also again, chlorine. And then you have your tussle with the O attached to it, and then pyridine becomes pyridinium. But the side products only, um, it's just for memorization. This is what your professor is actually looking for. Any questions on turning alcohol into a good leaving group when it starts out as a bad leaving group by bribing it? And also let me know in the comments, does your professor require you to know this reaction? Meaning, are you actually asked to do all this or do you just have to know the basics? Now, as a heads up, if you are taking the ACS exam, you do have to know not only the steps, but you have to know the name and what these things look like. So you do need to know this structure if you're taking the ACS. So the next reaction that I want to look at is reversing a different one that we already looked at, the dehydration of an alcohol. Okay, and I, as I go through it, I want you to see which reaction we're reversing. If I have an alcohol and I want to remove it, one way, if I want to get a pi bond, is to react it with well, our good old friend H2SO4. And the difference between this and the other reaction that I'm going to show you has to do with the concentration. And it also helps if you have heat. That helps drive the reaction forward. What will happen is the oxygen is going to grab a hydrogen from H2SO4. Remember that H2SO4 is really just a source of protons in solution. And so this is the activation step. We're turning alcohol into a good leaving group, similar to what I showed you earlier with the bromine reaction on a tertiary. But here it's a little different. I have the OH, another hydrogen, lone pair in a positive charge. This is a good leaving group. And especially in the present, actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let's show what happens to a good leaving group. Well, it leaves. What I'm left with is water in solution and then a carbocation at the secondary position. Now this could potentially undergo an SN1 or E1 reaction. Remember, those two are always in competition. So if I have water attacking it, we're not gonna show it because I'm simply getting back to where I was before. So why am I going to show this one and this one and this one and this one? I just need to understand that it's a reversible reaction. But having heat and making the acid concentrated is going to drive it towards the elimination product. Toward, I just gave it away. Oops. <laughs> it's going to drive the forward reaction of what I'm showing. And what that is, is another water molecule. It could be this one. It could be another one from solution. It's going to grab one of the hydrogens at the beta position. Instead of attacking at the alpha position, it's going to attack at the beta position, a beta elimination reaction. The electrons holding hydrogen to carbon will collapse, forming a pi bond in the direction of the carbocation. And this gives me an elimination product for an E1 reaction. So dehydration is an E1 reaction, also something you learned in Orga 1. But now that you're in the alcohol chapter, we're kind of tying a bow on it and bringing all these reactions back together. Okay, so another thing that will typically come up this semester is, yeah, you learned this in Orga 1, but show me that you know how to apply everything to a tricky mechanism. And I saw um, Stella, your professor wants you to know arrow pushing. So Stella, let's see how you feel about a reaction like this. Say you see this molecule on your exam. 
and you're told to react it with H2SO4 and heat. That triangle means heat. And the product is this. So what's the challenge of this problem? You're given the reactant. You're given the reagent. You're given the product. Well, what you're not given is the mechanism. So you're looking at this and thinking, oh, where do I even begin, right? If you watched my synthesis session, the first thing I teach you to do when you do a reaction, a mechanism, a synthesis, is not to start doing what you know. It's to ask two simple questions. Question one, what is the same? And question two, what is different? The same here is the number of carbon atoms. But what's different is that a methyl moved and the alcohol went to, that's not a pi, the alcohol turned into a pi bond. Now we know how to turn an alcohol into a pi bond, but how did the methyl move? I had a 2,2-dimethyl and my product is a 1,2-dimethyl. So this is where you think, okay, in order for the methyl to move, I had to have a methyl shift. And in order to do a methyl shift, I had to have a carbocation rearrangement. Well, doesn't sulfuric acid give us a carbocation rearrangement? Yeah. Once you recognize that, hopefully the mechanism I'm about to show you is going to feel very, very simple. H2SO4 is simply a source of protons in solution. And so as any good acid catalyzed reaction will begin is the electronegative atom attacking the proton. For the interest of time, we're going to do that. This will give me everything so far as I see it, but I have an extra hydrogen sitting on my molecule with a lone pair and a positive charge. We just turned alcohol, a bad leaving group, into alcohol, a axonium, a great leaving group, because it comes off as a water molecule in solution, and water is very stable, so it doesn't mind that it was kicked out. I'm left with a carbocation, and the water that I kicked out has, I'll just put it on the bottom here, I have one hydrogen that's purple, one hydrogen that's blue, I had a red lone pair of electrons, and I'll show these as a green lone pair so you can see exactly where everything came from. Now, here's another trick that I teach in my hydride shift methyl shift video, and that is a secondary carbocation near a quaternary carbon is going to give you an alkyl shift, an R group shift. In this case, the methyl is going to shift over, giving me, uh, we're running out of room, so we'll put it here, giving me a methyl here, a methyl here, and the carbocation just moved up here. Don't forget we had a hydrogen here, is that? So there's still a hydrogen, but this one is the deficient one. That's where I have my carbocation. Now, the last step, another water molecule in solution will come over, grab the most substituted hydrogen, collapse those electrons towards the carbocation, and that gives me my final product, which surprisingly was just an E1 dehydration reaction. If you like this one and you want more practice like this, I will send you the worksheet tonight with a couple of extra practice problems. That way you get, well, I'll put this one on so you can try it again and a couple more as well. All right, so let's move on to oxidation. Let's first do a quick review, something you should have covered in detail in general chemistry of redox. There were a lot of different mnemonics that you probably heard. My favorite one, the one I find most relevant to chemistry and organic chemistry is Leo the lion says, grrr. That was supposed to be my scary growl. And what this stands for is loss of electrons oxidation gain of electrons reduction. I like this because I find it to be the most telling of the mnemonics. And then here we want to take it a step further. 
What happens if I take an electron plus a proton? Well, I just get a hydrogen atom, right? Isn't hydrogen just an electron and a proton? When it comes to redox, I want you to think of hydrogen and oxygen are opposites. So if I have a reaction that is oxidation or reduction, all I have to do is identify what is happening to either hydrogen or oxygen. Okay, so with this in mind, we can look at it from both perspectives. But in the alcohol chapter, we will mostly focus on the oxygen. It just makes sense. So what can we expect for alcohol oxidation? If I have a primary alcohol, I can do two steps for oxidation. If I do only one level of oxidation, then that primary alcohol will get oxidized to an aldehyde. There's still that hydrogen. Well, there's two hydrogens here. Now there's only one. But I can oxidize the alcohol one more step and get, I'm sorry, I can oxidize the aldehyde and get a carboxylic acid. So let's take a look at what happens. Notice this is going to be a bond of carbon to blank. That's what we're looking at. So notice that the carbon in question here has one bond to oxygen, two bonds to oxygen, and three bonds to oxygen. That is oxidation. Or we can look at how many fewer bonds to hydrogen. Notice that the first one has two bonds to hydrogen, one bond to hydrogen, no bonds to hydrogen. So let's go back to the mnemonic. If we lose electrons or lose hydrogen, that is oxidation. Notice that we lost hydrogen from two to one to zero sitting on that carbon. That's where this comes in. With electrons and hydrogen, it's a little trickier, but if you look at oxygen, forget this mnemonic, the easier mnemonic is oxidation is Add oxygen bonds. Oxidation, oxygen bonds. So the primary alcohol was able to be oxidized twice. If I have a secondary alcohol, I can only oxidize it once because I run out of bonds to make to carbon. So if I take this alcohol and I oxidize it, the only product that I can get, unless I split the molecule open, is a ketone. So primary alcohol gives us an aldehyde and a carboxylic acid. Secondary alcohol only gives us a ketone. That's the overview. Now let's look at how we do this. What are the oxidation reagents that you know or recognize or learned? So there are a bunch of different reagents that you're typically going to see for oxidation, and I will write out a few. You will probably see chromic acid, H2CrO4. If you put chromic acid into a solution with H2SO4, this is called Jones reagent. So if you're seeing a Jones reagent and you're panicking, it's just chromic acid in sulfuric acid. You will also see different variations of this. For example, you may see CrO3 in H2O, but CrO3 in H2O is going to undergo a reaction to give you, well, H2CrO4, chromic acid. You might see a different version of this. For example, K2CrO7. Are you noticing a pattern with what I'm drawing here? Notice that the reagents here all have, well, a crap ton of oxygen, but you also have a lot of chromium. So chromium with oxygen typically is a good way to get your oxidizing reagent. But the key that I want you to recognize here is lots of oxygen. If you see lots of oxygen, please don't give me a reduction. Yes, I've seen students do that. So lots and lots of oxygen. The thing about these reagents is these are all strong oxidizing reagents. 
and they will give me a reaction from alcohol to ketone. And they will also give me a reaction from alcohol to carboxylic acid. They will not stop along the way. So these are all strong. And that means a secondary alcohol will go to a ketone. And a primary alcohol will go all the way to a carboxylic acid. What if you're not looking for a carboxylic acid? What if you only want the aldehyde? Um, before I answer that, I noticed a comment, lithium aluminum hydride. If oxidation reagents have a lot of oxygen, take a look at this one. Lithium aluminum hydride. Sodium borohydride. Sodium hydride, and so on. Notice hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. These are all reduction. That is your clue. Lots of oxygen oxidation. Lots of hydrogen reduction. So going back to my question, how do I make sure that my primary alcohol does not turn into a carboxylic acid, but instead stops at the aldehyde? I see a couple of correct answers coming in. PCC is correct. PCC. If you're taking the ACS, you want to know what it is. But if you're not, you can just study it as PCC. PCC is pyridinium chlorochromate. What do you see here? Once again, a chromate, a relative of chromic acid, which gave us oxidation. But the thing about this is the way the reagent is set up, it actually makes it less reactive. It slows it down and it stops at the aldehyde. It does not go all the way to what would have been a carboxylic acid. And as one of my students said, a good way to remember this is PCC starts with a P. It's a prude. It doesn't go all the way and stops at the aldehyde. Right, so these are the basic reactions that you have to know for this chapter. Now, there are a couple more advanced reactions that you're probably going to study. And that includes Grignard's protecting groups. So if you want to protect the alcohol to react something else. Um, Williamson ether synthesis, which is kind of an alcohol reaction, but it typically shows up under ethers and a lot more. Now we're not gonna have time to go through this today, but I do cover these reactions in detailed workshops of their own in my membership site. So I have my organic chemistry study hall is a membership site in tutoring group. That's where you can work with me and you have access to all of my lectures, not just what I have on YouTube, but in depth, everything on organic chemistry one and organic chemistry too, as well as a tutoring group where you can ask questions every day. So it's not something that you have to Google or search YouTube or try to figure something out because it's not just what's the answer to this question, it's I'm stuck on this, where do I go? What am I not understanding? So as a study hall member, you're going to get essentially tutoring in the group to help you learn, understand the what, the why, the how behind all of these reactions. If that is something you're interested in, I would love to have you. The link is layforsci.com slash join. And then for additional practice on alcohol reactions, including everything that we covered today, but problems on each of these, make sure you sign up for the worksheet and session notes. The link is at the bottom. So that's right here, layforsci.com slash or go live. I will send that out a little bit after signing off. If you're watching the recording, you go to the same link, sign up, and you're going to get access to that, as well as all the previous sessions that I've taught. That means the worksheet on spectroscopy, the worksheet on substitution reactions, the worksheet on alkene reactions, and so many more. So if you have any other questions, make sure once the video goes live, you post them in the comments, and I will see you guys next week for our next topic. Have a wonderful evening.